notice that the word no is the word ook, O-U-K. That's a, that's a strong negative in the Greek language. Now, in the English, you just have no, and I suppose it's how you say it, how strong it is, isn't it? No! That's kind of strong, isn't it? But in the Greek language, they have different ways of saying that without making an exclamation out of it, out of your voice. Then the word variation is interesting. Power alage is a word that means no changing. That's what, with the word ook. It means no changing. So it teaches the immutability of God because the immutability is the unchangeableness of God. God never changes. And I, I wonder, I mean, we say that theologic, I wonder how you, if you understand how important that is to your life. That the mere fact of that essence works on your behalf. I mean, I wonder if we really understand how that, how that works in our Christian life, the immutability of God. You know, when we look at the essence box, everybody goes, they go speedily through it. And I think sometimes we don't pay attention to the power of the essence of God in our life. So we're going to look at immutability to God. Listen to me, God never changes. Now listen, that's not true with us. We're ever changing, aren't we? And that's not a bad thing. It's, we're ever changing, no. If... If there were no decisions in your life, you would still be ever-changing because you get older. You know, you go from two years old to three years old. It has no choice of your own. You go from two to three. You go from 50 to 60. It's not a choice, right? It's not a choice. And so our lives change. We're in an ever-changing world because of Adam's sin. We age and we die because of Adam's sin. We live in a world that ages because of Adam's sin. This earth is part of that. And so we're, we're mutable. And I can't tell you, our life is ever-changing. Your marriage, is marriage, your family, your personal life is ever-changing. How important it is, is to have the steadiness of God in your life that never changes. The constant, the consistency of God in your life never changes. And that's what he says today in this, in reference to the Father of lights. Uh, that's what he says. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to take a look at this day. The immutability of God and how important it is to your Christian life, your everyday life. The fact that God never changes and that you're ever-changing. Whether you make choices or don't make choices, you're ever-changing. And how does the immutability of God fit into that dynamics of our life? We'll talk about it today in Jesus' name. Let's have prayer. As Al said, I give that moment. You can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. The dynamics of understanding the Bible is the Holy Spirit. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or reverse sins. You can't study the Bible in carnality. It's an empty book. It's a dead book. The Holy Spirit brings that thing to life. And once he brings it to life, then the word of God has a life on its own in your life. So I'm going to give you a moment of silence uh, to confess sin if necessary. How, what do I do with carnality? You confess the sin. It takes care of the carnality restores you to fellowship in the Holy Spirit. He teaches you, guides you, directs you. He's the great memory banker. He's the great secretary of the Word of God in your, in your life. He files everything, files everything in your heart. What a wonderful thing that is. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the immutability of God and break it down into our personal life that we might see how important that is I mean, when he is our refuge, when he is our refuge in the time of storms, how does the immutability apply to that? When Jonah gets thrown over the boat, over the bo off the boat and sinks like a rock to the bottom of the ground and then is trapped by seaweed around his head and he can't get out of it except by the grace of God, 
How does immutability work for him, that a big fish would come along and swallow him? How does the immutability of God work in that case when all the decisions and all the possibilities in life are absolutely gone? The one thing that hasn't changed, even though his life has changed a thousand and one times in a split second, God has remained steady. And how important it is. God still has a a plan for his life. God still has a design on his life. There's a destiny. And God is going to spit him out of that, not because he deserves it, not because he wills it. God is going to spit him out and put him back on his feet to do the mission. Why? God is faithful. God is immutable. He has never changed in all of that. Yet look how many times Jonah's, and Jonah's life has changed because of bad decisions. Well, teach us today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the doctrinal points that I want to make with you today about God's essence of immutability, you know, when we draw a box on, the, on our papers and we, we look at the essence of God, sometimes it's just rote. By that I mean God, God is omnipresent. He is always present. You go like, yeah, sure. And when you get to something like immutable, people go like, I, I don't know. I could possibly wrap my brain around that. And, and so I think, sure, it's good to memorize the essence of God. But if you don't get engaged in it, what I want you to do is I want to take one of these today, and I want you to learn to engage in the essence of God. I mean, what does it mean to your life that God is all present, God is all powerful? What does that mean? I mean, why do you fall apart if God is, if God is all powerful? How can you fall, fall apart and the least little thing comes into your life? All of a sudden, you drop into fear and, and doubt and frustrations. What's go, what is with that? If, if God is all powerful, if God is always present, If God is omniscient, if God is sovereign, if God is immutable, if God is veracity, if God is love, eternal life, and all the other, why are you falling apart? Why do you always hear something and perceive it's bad news when God says you can never get bad news from me? Now, the world's full of bad news. (laughs) You do listen to the news every once in a while, don't you? The world's full of bad news. No matter, no matter what you do, they always see it. They, it seems like the world always sees something half empty, never half full. And, and so hope, hopefully this lesson will teach you to pay attention to the essence of God in your everyday life and how important they are. Here's immutability. Here's immutability in James 1.17, as I read in my introduction. I'm going to look at three things today about the immutability, immutability of God how it affects your life, okay? How it affects your life. Here's a great verse. Now, I think it's Tuesday night. I'm going to come back and I'm going to do a study on this. I, I, I believe it's Tuesday night. I'm not, I'm not positive, but I believe it's Tuesday night. I'm going to do a study on this. But in Hebrews, now listen, here's the immutability of God, and I'm going to show you the Greek word. Now, the Greek word we have for the immutability of God, theologically, is not in my text. Variation shows you the concept. But I'm going to sh- it is found in Hebrews, the sixth chapter. And one of the things, you know, here's point one. The main Greek word for the immutability of God, I wrote on your paper, is made up of three words. It has the, it has the A on the front. That's an alpha privative. That means un. And then it has the word changing. Metathalos is the word changing unchangeable. That's the key word, unchangeable. That's the way we describe this in English, or never, never, never change. Never, never changes. Unchangeable. That is our Greek word, and that is the theological term for immutable. If you was to look this up in the English theological dictionary, and you wanted to find out what the Greek word, they would tell you that. Okay, like just simply something as simple in your library as a Vines Greek word book. They would tell you that. Now, so one of the things 
I'm going to quote from a passage, but this is important because I tell you this all the time. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through 20, now listen to me, is one Greek sentence. Now, that's really important. It carries a completed thought. A sentence carries a completed thought. I forgot to look in the English. I don't know if that's a, I don't know how the English did that. But that's one Greek sentence. That's important because I'm pulling, in verse 16, they introduce this sentence by telling you that men swear by oath by one greater than themselves. Then he explains why. You know what he means here? Here's what he means. Here's what the writer's talking about. You put your hand in the air, put your hand on the Bible, and you take an oath. Old school used to put your hand on the Bible and swear to God. And that's what the writer means in verse 16. It's interesting to me that Congress don't, won't, won't let the rest of us do it, but every time they get sworn in, they put their hand in the Bible, put their hand in the air and swear to God. The rest of us can't do that. That's interesting to me. Well, anyhow, so what we're dealing with in verse 16 is court of law where we raise our hand and swear to God because he's sovereign. You know why they did that? Because our, it used to be in our nation that be, believe, believe, people believed in God and believed he was sovereign. Sovereign meaning that he was absolute ext- supreme authority over life and nations, churches. There was a time when we believed that God was, the God was over the church, that God was over nations, that God were over people. And we, the church, has allowed people to tell us that ain't true anymore. I don't care how you vote it, it's still true. I don't care how you vote it, still true. And the church needs to stand to the truth. We need to be on the front line of that argument. So in verse 16, he sets this thing up. Now watch verse 17 and 18. Now he's going to tell you why. Why do people swear, and when they, when they swear under oath, they put their hand on the Bible, this is what they're talking about, and swear before God that what they're going to say is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. You got that? All right. Now look at verse 17. It says, God's promises are unchangeable. That's our word. It's immutable. Because immutability means unchangeable. Now, he attached this to the, to the scriptures and the promises, which we call categorical thinking. Other churches just call them promises. We're not content with that. We call it categorical thinking. We, want, we don't want just a promise. We want to understand that promise as clear as we can so that that promise can be effective in our life. We call it categorical thinking, uh, theologically categorical thinking. God's promises are what? Are what? Unchangeable. Why? Because God is immutable. Because God is unchangeable. I put my hand in the oath, put my hand on the Bible, and swear before God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Or I put my hand on the Bible, put my hand before God, and I say, I believe the scripture is the, is the absolute truth of God, and by that I will live my life. You understand that? You know why that's important? Because you're ever changing and God isn't. He's your, he's your, one, he's your one flat line. He's your one stability in this life. He is the only stability in your life. Everything else is changing. And that's a good thing. But the better thing than your life ever changing is the fact that God is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever, right? He's not going to change. His word is not going to change. His promises are not going to change. How important is that? See, I, often I, I hear a second generation come up and say, well, that's old fogey belief. I don't believe that way anymore. That's, that's, that's an old-timey religion. Well, God never changes. His word never changes. His promise never changes, and that's a good thing. And 
in your heart, you ought to be saying right now, thank you, God. That's what I need in my marriage. That's what I need in my business. That's what I need in my life. That's what I need in my church. That's what I need in my relationships with people. And so he says God's promises are unchangeable, and he tells you why. Because God is immutable. Verse 18, he says there are two unchangeable things that's immutable. And he shows you how they apply to your life. No, you're missing this. I hate that. You're, you're missing it. For some reason, you're just sitting there floating around. Look, look. Here's what's important for you. Put both feet on floor. Put both feet on floor. You got both of them solid like he's going to stand up? Now listen to me. All right? You're grounded in now. Now listen to me. When he says there are two unchanged, he says now the promises of God are always there because God is what? Unchangeable. God is, this is because God is immutable. Then he says, I'm going to tell you two things that are important to your life about the immutability of God. Are you with me? All right. Here's what he says. In order the two unchangeable things, he gives a point A and a point B. Do not miss this because these things are so important to your life and they're based on the immutability of God because God's promises are immutable. They're unchangeable. Now listen. One, it is impossible for God to lie. See the word impossible? Impossible. Oh, you say, what about this? Impossible. Well, what about this? Impossible. Well, what about this? Impossible. Oh, I got one. What about this? Impossible. The, listen, it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, his promises are always what? True. The Holy Spirit's job, who is called the spirit of truth in John 14, 15, and 16, He's called the spirit of truth. His job is to be sure in the church age that you don't miss any truth about the promises of God. That's his job. That's his job. Jesus warned ahead of time in John 8, 32, you will, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In John 14, 6, as he prepares to tell you about the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, he says, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but me. Is that a truth? You know why? Because of, because of Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know why? He's immutable. In the divine nature, he's immutable. And you know why his life, although he's in a world of ever-changing, his life never changed. Was Jesus was in the flesh and his life was changed. Did he age? Well, I hear 12 and I heard 30. Was, it, was he always in an ever-changing world? Was his life ever-changing? Yes. What, what was the flat line? What kept him stable? The Word of God and the Holy Spirit. 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 You know what keeps you stable in this ever-changing world and the ever-changing life you have? The Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And I, it, it amazes me that you don't pay more attention to that. It amazes me that you don't walk by faith. You walk by sight. It amazes me that you walk by flesh and not by the Spirit. It bothers me. It bothers me. Because I know that when you walk by sight, you're out into the world. You're, you're into that ever-changing, messy world. And the only stableness that you have in that whole thing is God. And you need to understand the immutability of God. God never changes. His promise never changes. What he tells you is going to happen. You need to be on the, the positive side of happening, not on the negative side like Jonah. You need to be on the positive side of, of what's happening in your life, not on the negative. So, it's two unchangeable things, he said, in your life. It's impossible for God to lie to you. 
Now, let me tell you, in John 8, 44, he says the devil's a liar and he's the father of lies and can't tell you the truth. You know what he represents? He, he, listen, the devil represents, listen to me now, the devil represents the worldview of thinking. John 12, 31, 16, 11, 1 John 5, 19, he's the God of this world. He pushes his agenda, always changing your life. Oh, you have no constant in your life. What are you talking about? You don't believe in that Bible and God stuff, do you? I mean, God gave you a mind. Think for yourself. Come on, Eve. Think for yourself. Come on, Eve. Throw that Bible away. Think for yourself. You, you've got a mind like God. Don't be a puppet to God. He don't tell you that if you're, if you're not a puppet to God, you're a puppet to him. He don't tell you that until it's too late, and he's pulling all the strings in your life. It's impossible for God to lie. That's one. Listen to the second one. Now, this is you, right? It's impossible for God to lie to you. It's impossible. Say impossible. Thank you. Now, believe it. It's impossible. All things work together for those who love God. You don't mean all things. No, I mean all things. <laughs> it couldn't be all things. I just got the word worst medical report you could ever want. That's a good thing, Ron? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So... Does God change his mind because you don't like to report? No, you change your mind because God says it's a good report. What are you going to do with that? You going to go the way of the world? Call God a liar? I don't know. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but listen to this one. Here's the second thing. Two, un rate, two, unchangeable, two unchangeable things based on the immutability of God. There's the first one, impossible for God to lie. Second one, we have strong endurance. Boy, I wonder what's going on. <laughs> what was going on? Did I got to have strong endurance? Wonder what's going on. I wonder what's going on in your life that you got to have strong endurance. You've got to suck it up. Strong endurance. Something going on. Something big going on, right? In this ever-changing world of your life. You thought you had it all planned out. You thought you had it just squared away. Yadda, yadda, yadda. And now it's turned upside down. When it is, it's right side up as far as God's concerned. We, because of the immutability, the immutability of God, it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. It doesn't matter what, what waves are rushing over me. It does not matter. I have what? Strong encouragement because I have the flout line. I have the stability in my life because God is immutable. He never changes, and I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm not going to be up. I'm not going to be down. I'm okay. You know, a bobber's an interesting thing, isn't it? As a kid, I used to love fishing with bobbers. Good use could sleep a little bit. Oh, there it goes. See, a bobber, we're a bobber. When we understand the, Im the immutability of God, it makes us a bobber. It don't matter if we go up, don't matter go up, we're still on top. We're still floating. We're okay. And it doesn't matter if something pulls us deeper down or, or bob, lets us go. And we bob back. It doesn't matter. God is our constant. Because he's immutable. And he tells you, I am immutable. We may have strong endurance. We who have fled for refuge. That's how bad it was. 
Listen, even the world knows when things get tough, run. Run. We call it, we call it what? Fleeing, flight. Run from it. Run as far as you can. You can outrun God. You can run faster than God. Run, run, hide, run and hide, run and hide. No, no. Stand and fight. Stand and fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Let God be the constant. If you're going to run someplace, run to God. Run to God. Run to God. He's immutable. He is sovereign. He is all-powerful. He is God Almighty. If you're going to run, run to God. If you need a break from what you're going through, run to God. That's what he's saying. Look, have strong endurance. If you're going to run, run for refuge. Run for God. Run for God. And listen what, listen what he says. Flee for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. You run to God because he's the only one has a hope set before you. I love that. You're running from, but he's got, he says, stop and run for. What you running from? Mm. Then stop. Find a refuge in God so that you can run for something instead of from something. I love, he, I love Romans 12, 12. Listen to what Romans 12, 12 says. It says, be joyful in hope. Do you know what he said before you? You're running, you're running for all the wrong reasons. You shouldn't be running. And if you're going to run, find refuge. It means sit down and, and be still. And instead of, instead of running with fear in your heart, stop and run and gather your sense about you and find your hope in the immutability of God. There is hope in the immutability of God. Listen to what he says. The, the, uh, the other unchangeable thing that we may have strong courage and that we may, we may have flight, that we may flee for refuge in, 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 in laying hold, there's a purpose in it, in laying hold of the hope set before us. You know, what, you know what he's saying? He said, listen, find God, because the worst thing could happen to you, die, and that would be the best thing. That's <laughs> the hope, the ultimate hope set before you is that, to be absent for the bodies, to be present with the Lord, that's the ultimate. See, we run from something. We need to stop, gather our wits about us, find our refuge in God, and begin to run for something. Stop living from something and start living for something. That's what the writer is trying to tell us. Be joyful in hope. Be joyful in hope. In Romans, the fifth cha 15th chapter, verse 4, it says, The Holy Scriptures... It is in the Holy Scriptures that we find our hope in God. It's in the Holy Scriptures. You're going to find it on Channel 6, Evening News. I don't care who, what you're watching. Here's one, Colossians 1.27. He talks about the Gentiles have hope they've never had before. He's, he calls it the glorious riches of the mystery of Christ in you. And he's talking to the Gentiles, a hope to the Gentiles. The riches, the glorious riches of the mystery that Christ cares uh, the same amount for them from the cross as he did for the Jews. That when they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ will enter their life and with full equal privileges as if they as if a Jew. Pretty good. 
Being a Gentile, I'm proud of that. I like that. I like that. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 15. Be diligent to present your, yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Watch this. Accurately handling the word of truth. You know what the word of truth is? You know what truth is? Veracity. Look at point two. The immutability of God has ten primary characteristics. Everybody talks about them. We use Latin words, omni, omni uh, present or whatever. So we have uh, omnipresent, all present, omni, omnipotent. You, you know all this. Uh, veracity. Veracity is God is truthful. He can never what? Never lie. Well, but why wouldn't you study the word of God and base your decisions and your thought patterns and your whole operation of your life? I don't care what you do. Why wouldn't you do it the way that would honor God in your life? You carry a Bible. You ever put your hand out and swear before God, you'll live it? <laughs> you'll live it. See, every time I open the Bible, I realize that God is speaking to my heart to live out what I study. He wants my feet to, he wants the word of God to be part of my walking life. I walk by faith, not by sight. And so we have words like that. We have immutability, immutability, unchangeableness of God. We have veracity. It's impossible for God to lie. We have sovereign. He is the absolute authority. He is the supreme authority of our, over our life, the supreme. No other authority has authority over our life as God does. He's, he's supreme. Sovereign is supreme authority. He's absolute authority. He's not going to give you options on it. Well, it's Monday. I don't have to do it. Or if you're, if you're a young person, it's Friday and I don't have to do it. It's Saturday and I don't have to do it. I'll think about Sunday and then I'll try to get my life back on track. Sovereign. I put down Daniel. I want you to pay attention on your own. You read Daniel, the fourth chapter, verses 24 through 39, and keep in mind the sovereignty of God as, as Daniel, as God speaks through Daniel, the prophet, to King Hezekiah. And he tells King Hezekiah what's going to happen to his life, and it's not a pretty sight. Listen, and because God is immutable, verse 29 says, and it all came to pass within 12 months. He went nuttier than a fruitcake. That's Michigan language. Nuttier than a fruitcake. And the Bible says it happened within 12. You know why? Because God is immutable. He's not going to change. He laid it out, and he said, this is it. It's just very interesting. Do you know your prayer life is based on the sovereignty of God? Your prayer life. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says your entire prayer life is based on the sovereignty of God. If you ask anything according to his will. I mean, that's how we boil sovereignty down. The will of God. Righteousness, you know, that bothers a lot of, this idea of righteousness bothers a lot of people. So let me give you, let me give you an understanding of it. Whatever is right and just by the will of God is considered righteousness. Whatever, whatever is just and right by the will of God. Whatever is just and right by the will of God. I'll give you an example of it. Romans 4, read Romans 4 if you're interested. Romans 4. Love, eternal life, holiness. You know, you, you know what holiness? Holiness is the exercise of sanctification in our life. Same word. The root word, the root word for sanctification, the root word is holy. In the Greek language. It means you're setting your life apart Unto the holiness, the operation of the holiness of God, the divine character of God. 
Holiness is the sum total of the divine nature of God in your life where it comes out, holiness. Be holy for God is holy. Be holy for God is holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Powerful idea. Powerful idea. Here's a third point. Yeah, here's my third, here's my final point. Woo! I said it for you. While the believer is mutable, ever changing, God is immutable, never changing. Let me give an example of how we're always changing. We start out the, as a Christian. We start out the Christian life as a baby believer. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, uh, uh, desiring the sincere milk of the word of God. If we stay in the word of God, if we grow by grace and knowledge, hey, that second, that second Peter 3.18, grow in grace, did you know that's a present imperative? He's not asking your permission. That's a standing command. A present imperative, that's a command. That's a standing command in the Greek language. And it's a second person plural, meaning every one of us. Grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You start as a baby believer, desiring the sincere milk of the word of God. You grow into an apos, an immature believer, which is a natural, normal state. You're on the way to become a mature believer, a teleos. And, and what is all this growth for? Listen to me. Romans 8, 29, to conform you into the image and likeness of Christ. That's what all that growth for. If you're a baby believer, you know what you're a baby of? Image of Christ. When you're an immature believer, image of Christ. When you're a mature believer, you have a mature image of Christ. And what he wants you to do is to get into a consistent pattern in your life. We call it super grace, where this, you're not changing every day, and you're constant with God. Because once you hit super grace, you're not changing unless you digress. You're in a stable system. You understand? You went from a baby to an image to an api. You went from a brethos to an apios to a teleos in the Greek language. You went from a baby to an immature to a mature believer, a natural progression of spiritual development. And when you hit super grace, you've hit that spiritual mature basis, and you're in a constant with God. You're not up and down, up and down, up and down. One day I'm in, one day I'm out. Nah, 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 nah. That ought to be your goal. That ought to be your goal, not just to reach the, this, the mature image of Christ, to, but to maintain it so that it's reflective in my life, the way I live, the way I talk, the way I walk. When you look at the, this, the parable of Luke 15, now I, I, this is going to be your homework because I ran out of time. But listen to me. Here's what people miss when they that because there's so much story in it. But remember, it's one parable with three parts. Oh, 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 oh. It's one parable in three parts. Here's what people miss. They miss what is consistent in all three parts. Let me, let me show you. Here's the first part. Got 100 sheep. One gets lost. Right? What do they do? They go... Search for the one that's lost. Bring it back. What do they do? They rejoice. Not only that, but Jesus said, not only, do they, not only did the shepherd rejoice that he found the lost sheep, but the heaven rejoiced. Heaven rejoiced. Right? Goes to the woman. The woman with 10 coins, right? I had 100 sheep, and I, how many did I lose? I got 10 coins. The woman's got 10 silver coins. That, that was a lot of money. She lost one. She went out and found that one, brought it back. What did they do? Rejoiced. This time, he says, not only did heaven rejoice, but the angels rejoiced in heaven over it, right? What did he call the one sheep that was lost? A sinner. What, called it a sinner. What, the one coin that was lost, what they call it? Called it a sinner. Now he goes to the third part of the parable where we have two sons. 
How many gets lost? One. Is there, is, there, is there a common denominator going on here? And what is he called? A sinner. Now, why is this going on? Verses 1, 2, and 3. In verses 1, 2, and 3, the Pharisees have come to him, and they're disgusted with Christ because he is hanging out with a bunch of sinners. And he tells a parable of why sinners are important to God more than the 99 righteous or the nine or the other one. Are you with me? So you haven't paid attention to that parable well enough. It is one parable and it's teaching one point. It's one parable teaching one point. And he's got consistent. When he found, when he went out, when, they, when, the, 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 when the, the human, the lost son came to his senses and came back to the father, what did they do? They celebrated. They rejoiced, didn't they? They rejoiced. And here's how they described it. He who was lost is now found. He who was dead is now alive. You know, that's a wonderful parable, but you would miss it if you didn't understand how important the immutability of God was in that. How important is the immutability of God in the hundred sheep and the one lost? Second Peter, I'll tell you why, because the second Peter, third chapter, verse nine, tells you God's attitude towards the lost, the sinner. God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. It is not God's desire that any, be, that any perish. And there the immutability of God is working on the one lost, on the one lost, on the one lost. And the consistency of finding that one sinner brought into favor with God through Jesus Christ brings rejoicing in the heavens, brings rejoicing to God in all of heaven and of the angels in heaven. The immutability of God. And so I want you to pay attention to that, and I've given you other examples for home, home study. You will find this really important in your life if you go in there this week and go over that word study. Look at that parable and look for the immutability of God and how important that was in the, in the parable. This is one parable with one message. And the great underlying message in that is the immutability of God. God is not willing. He is not willing He's going to do everything within his power, within the sphere of the influence. He can have volition and not interfere in the angelic conflict to bring men into the kingdom. Let us pray. Are you one of those people that need to be brought into the kingdom? God is not willing that any would perish. I'll tell you, you're perishing because of Adam's sin, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him, believe in him, believe in what about him? That he went to the cross and died for our sins, was buried and raised on the de from the dead on the third day. When they believe in him, he will not perish. Notice how that ends. Once he believes, he will never perish again. He's done. The perishing is gone. Now he has eternal life in his place. Perishing, dying. Now he has eternal life. Why? Gift. Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 23 says, it's a gift. Eternal life is a gift. It is a gift of salvation. It is a gift. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't lose it. It's a gift. It's a gift from the grace of God and the sovereignty of God and the omnipotence of God. John, the 10th chapter, 28, tells me that when I, when I get saved, I'm in the hands of Christ who is in the hands of God, and no man is able to take me out. No man. Because of the immutability of God. 
The promise of God stands on the immutability of God. He will never lie to me. Veracity. He is sovereign. His will will always work. He is omnipotent. He is God Almighty. I thank you for that. I pray, Father, people on the Internet, wherever this goes across the, the world, will pay attention to this message. Pay attention to it. Get connected with God through Jesus Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And my goodness, when you come to the Father, what a wonderful thing that is. He becomes your Abba Father. He becomes your, your Daddy. Not just for a day, not until you just err. Pay attention to the prodigal son. Pay the story. Pay attention. Pay attention to the immutability of God. Oh, Father, we're so thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen.